call the meeting to order. Please call the roll. Mr. Cockrell. Here. Ms. Kelly. Yes. Mr. Majors. Yes. Mr. Denton. Yes. Mr. Allen. Yes. Next item will be the statement by the board vice president. As we begin this meeting, let us pause for a 60 second moment of silence to reflect, meditate, pray, or engage in any other silent activity. Thank you. All right, next item will be the Pledge of Allegiance, led by Ms. Cheryl Kelly, our Deputy Board Clerk. Salute, pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Next item, number four, formal adoption of the agenda. Any questions? So moved. Second. Motion and a second. Please call the roll. Mr. Cockrell? Yes. Ms. Kelly? Yes. Mr. Majors? Yes. Mr. Denton? Yes. Mr. Allen? Yes. Next item, number five, will be the minutes from the March 12th meeting. Discussion. Move approval of the March 12th, 2018 regular board, mini board meeting minutes. Second. Got a motion and a second. Please call the roll. Mr. Cockrell? Yes. Ms. Kelly? Yes. Mr. Majors? Yes. Mr. Denton? Yes. Mr. Allen? Yes. Sorry for not voting last time. Hang on. That's okay. <laughs> I barely got it in. You should have your buttons here. All right. Thank there you. There we go. <clears throat> Next item, number six, the March 28th board meeting minutes discussion. Approval. Second. Motion and a second. Please call the roll. Mr. Cockrell. Yes. Ms. Kelly. Yes. Mr. Majors. Abstain. Mr. Denton. Yes. Mr. Allen. Yes. Thank you. Now some good news here, this next item. <laughs> Been a long week, Miss Knight. Uh, sorry, next item, Miss Knight. <laughs> President Allen, uh, board members, Dr. Dunlop, I do have the pleasure of bringing some levity and joy into the, the room today via these fine young ladies. Come up here, girls. I want to see you. Now. <laughs> <laughs> this is our junior varsity cheer team. I had the pleasure of introducing them to you last year as a two-time national champion. They won not only last year, they won the, um, the regular cheer division, but they also won the new division called Game Day. Well, this year, they almost did it again. They actually won the Game Day division. They swept the, the dance, the cheer, and the sideline division. They won all three, so they're the national champion for that. Wow. But they came in second in the other competition as well. So taking four routines, sweeping in both last year, and then winning and coming runner up again this year. It doesn't get much better than that. And a lot of that goes to these, obviously these wonderful young ladies, but there are two coaches right here. We have Amber Slim. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> and Kirsten, who is now Della Hante. Della Hante. Both of these fine young coaches came back and sat in my office and um, uh, closed the door and I thought, oh no, they can't quit now. <laughs> they're, they're on a roll. But they're both um, 
expected mothers and they're right. still going to coach and I just thought I'd share their good news as well. So. <laughs> <clears throat> Please do. ladies are very experienced. We didn't have to tell you to say what grade you're in. You've been here before. <laughs> Great job. Ladies, just because you've been here, we still get to shake every one of your hands, so you're going to have to start back down there. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hey, you, hey Grunoff, give your dad a hard time. Okay? Congratulations. 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 Great job, young ladies. Good to see you again. Congratulations. Congratulations. Great job, ladies. Great job. Next year, see you here next year. All right. Good job. Good job. Let's hope they're on varsity and win one. Good job, ladies. Good job. Good job, Coach. Thank you so Congratulations. Much. Oh, thank you. Good. you too. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Good job. That's fun. Winning never gets old. That's a breath of fresh air. It is. All right, next item, number eight, Miss Sagely. President Allen, Dr. Dunlop, and board members, it is my honor to be here tonight uh, to tell you about a grant we received from the Oklahoma Energy Resources Board in the amount of $36,846.50. With this generous STEM funding, we are going to be able to expand our robotics programming both in and after school and reach more students than ever. In 2014, I stood here before you to ask you for your approval for a $4,000 grant that funded eight robots for eight elementary sites to start our robotics program um, with 49 students. Since that time, through other grants, donations, corporate sponsorships, and fundraisers, we have grown the program to now reach multiple teams at all 22 sites. We have nearly 300 students now participating on, in the after school teams and 200 more waiting to participate. Just last week, our high school, I'm not sure if you heard, but we uh, qualified for the national championships and we'll be able to send them off to Houston in two weeks. And that's the second year in a row that they have qualified for the championships and we are so proud of them. So thank you so much for all of your support so far <laughs> with robotics and tonight I stand here before you to ask you again for your approval on this money that is being donated by the OERB. With these funds we intend to increase student engagement with robotics and we will be able to purchase much needed technology and uh, additional robots and equipment for all of the schools. 
At this time, I would like to introduce Executive Director Mindy Stitt from the Oklahoma Energy Resources Board to say a few words about the donation. Board, thank you so much for allowing me into your board meeting this evening. I uh, appreciate your time and uh, I hope that you will approve this grant. It will <laughs> go certainly to a good cause. I want to tell you just a little bit about the ORB. I'm not going to take a whole lot of your time, but our organization is voluntarily funded and we're mainly known for our well site restoration program. We clean up orphan and abandoned well sites across the state of Oklahoma and we are quickly approach approaching 17,000 sites that we have restored. Uh, another big part of what we do that a lot of people don't know about is our education program and the resources that we provide to uh, schools across the state. We actually have nine different curricula for K through 12. These are all hands-on science, math, STEM related programs. Uh, we provide free training to all the teachers. Uh, we actually have a workshop coming up this summer in the Tulsa area, so I hope the uh, teachers from your school will attend uh, for w one of our programs, K through 12. And uh, we um, also have a well site safety program, a scholarship program, a lot of other things that we do. But on top of what uh, our voluntary funds go to each year, this year our board voted to provide $2 million to ed education for STEM related programming. So that's why we're here tonight to hopefully uh, pr provide this grant to the school district for STEM -rel related programming. So it's been a lot of fun traveling around the state delivering the checks. And uh, so this is just one more of our stop, and, and uh, I'm uh, so happy you uh, allowed us to come into your board meeting. So. Questions, discussions? We want to thank you very much yeah. um, for your generous donation, and uh, we know it'll touch a lot of kids. And uh, Ms. says we want to thank you for your leadership, because I know uh, several years ago we had to make some tough cuts in what we were going to do with the program, I believe, and we talked about that as a board. So. Uh, You've, you've taken us to new levels, and we sure appreciate your leadership and what you do for our children. It means a lot. And if you would allow, we have a check presentation we would like to do. Yeah. Let, us, let us vote to approve it. All right. And then let's get that picture with that big check. <laughs> yes. <laughs> two L's and Alan, too. Hope you got that. Okay. I move approval. Second. Motion and a second. Please call the roll. Mr. Cockrell. Yes. Ms. Kelly. Yes. Mr. Majors? Yes. Mr. Denton? Yes. Mr. Allen? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Big check time. Big check and picture time. Ms. Saisley, thank you. Do a nice job. job. Yeah. Hey, how many students do you think that'll be? How many more students? Next item, under employment, number nine, Ms. Coates. Good evening, President Allen, Dr. Dunlop, and board. I bring to you tonight a discussion, motion, and vote on motion to approve or disapprove the offer of employment to an individual to serve as a Broken Arrow High School grade level principal with such employment subject to mutually acceptable and fully executed written contract of employment. The person I bring to you tonight is Mr. Mickey Replogle. We interviewed eight internal candidates. Um, all were outstanding. It made our hearts sing to uh, visit with these candidates and see the talent that we are building and we have here in Broken Arrow. So I would like to make a motion. Oh, I don't make the motion. I would like to <laughs> um, um, su Love submit um, <laughs> Mr. Mickey Replogle for your consideration. Make a motion to approve. Second. Motion and a second. Please call the roll. Mr. Cockrell. Yes. Ms. Kelly. Yes. Mr. Majors. Yes. Mr. Denton. Yes. Mr. Allen. Yes. Introducing. All right. Thank you so much. And Mr. Replogel, would you please stand up? Thank you. Thank you. Next item, comments from the public, we have none. Next item, number 11, Dr. Dunlop. 
Thank you, President Allen. I'm, I'm giving the update, a uh, legislative update this week, and there's really been nothing at all happen at the Capitol, so no, <laughs> I'm just teasing. Uh, clearly, we've had a flurry of activity. Um, if you've been under a rock, uh, maybe you didn't know, but we have quite a few teachers at the Capitol right now. And as a result, we do have a lot of action at the Capitol. Um, we, we were able to, um, or the teachers were able to secure, of course, a, a, a teacher pay raise last week, and then a 1,250 raise for support employees. But we still have quite a gap um, that exists in the general, general revenue budget, and so we continue to see work on that. So specifically what happened today, in the House, um, Inman tried to suspend the House rules to force a vote, a vote on Senate Bill 1086. And if you're like me, you don't know any of the numbers. What that is, that's the capital gains exemption that we've heard a lot of d discussion around. Um, it, it failed. 26 nay, 58 nay, or 26 yes and 58 no. Um, so it doesn't look like that's even going to be heard. He also tried to suspend the House rules and force a vote on House Bill 2985, which is the COLA. That's the um, raised cost of living increase for our retirees. That also failed. Uh, in the Senate today, we saw some action from one of our local senators, Nathan Dom, uh, filed Senate Bill 6 X today. And so I learned this, this last week that when you have the X's after a bill number, the, if there's one X, that means it's in the first special se session. If there's two, it means it's in the second special session. If there's no X's, then it's in the regular session. So obviously Senate Bill 6 X means it's in the sen second special session. And what this does is this is um, ending the practice of wind energy when we write the checks at the end for, for exemptions. So what's been going on is um, if they, they get tax credits, if it exceeds um, the, the surplus, we end up writing them a check back in addition. And so he's trying to put an end to that. Um, the bill has $6.9 million earmarked for education in fiscal year tw uh, 2020 and $70.3 million for education in tw uh, fiscal years 21 through 29. Um, he, this comes from a bill, Senate Bill 888, which he was going to propose in the general session, but because of the pressure that's been put on at the Capitol recently, he's moved it into the special session. So both of these would only, would, uh, only take a 50% or 50% plus one-tenth. Uh, one uh, so not a super majority. So there's there's a possibility there. So if you do uh, feel the need, please reach out and contact your local legislator if you feel like this is something you would support. Uh, the governor today still has not signed or vetoed House Bill 1012 double X. That's that hotel motel uh, tax repeal. If you remember, the House passed it, went to the Senate, the Senate repealed it. So if the governor um, votes to veto that repeal, then it, it does go into effect. And we have seen no action yet on that. I would welcome any questions. Dr. Dunlop, we had some, uh, <laughs> some questions or some discussions in subcommittees to th this teacher's raise. Yes. And um, so now, I guess, and, and now that I believe you were, we were in the same meeting, and like if we have 1,200 teachers at the end of the school year. Yes. That's what they're going to give raises to, yes. correct? Yes, that's correct. So if we add a teacher or two next year to our staff, we have to fund that ourselves, that we raise, do. locally? We do. So really you're punished to try to, I should say punished, but if you try to uh, expand a uh, well, if you build offering. a new building. Well, there you go. If you build a new building, you got to put teachers in it. Correct. <laughs> So if you increase your staff, it, it's going to damage you. It really, it's, there's going to be winners and losers in this. The winners are those that are decreasing in size because they're going to be based on their staffing from this year and not next year. But t uh, districts like ours that are growing, it will be the losers because we won't be able to fund those, uh, those raises for the additional staff. We'll have to take it out of our general revenue. Ms. Natalie? What I don't know at this time is um, that Staffing numbers will be re-examined the same time as our midterm adjustment numbers for our to, to make a um, based on the October yeah. one count. That would be um, everyone's hope and expectation that that would be adjusted at that time. But I have not uh, received clear um, guidance on on how that will work through the formula at this time. 
but those funding factors that they passed was for X amount of dollars or they're anticipating. So it would be for, um, I would assume that they're, they got to that by the total number of teachers we have in the state anyways right now to say, this is what we need for that many dollars to provide that raise to our teachers. So I think that's where the misunderstanding is, is that we need funding in a big, big way as well as the must deserve teacher raise. Mm -hmm. So we can add, when we add a school and we grow, that you know we don't take the hit in our general fund. I, I would think that is the message that should be correct, given loud and clear to the state. And I will be at the State Department tomorrow, most of the day, uh, in, a, in at the Capitol for the next two days. So I'm hoping to get some answers from some of these questions. Is this a possibility? I know when we had uh, the you, you went and got certified nationally board certified, and they promised you this five thousand extra dollars. I mean. But then we took the cut. Now, what is it, twenty five hundred or two thousand dollars? Now I don't remember what it is was that, this year. They they change the amount they pay could, out on it every year. Could you foresee us being in the very same situation as, as that road we went down with that? You're saying that they're basing their figures on it are based on uh, estimates for tax collection. Okay. If those estimates don't come in as projected or as promised, um, the state department only has X number of dollars to mm -hmm. distribute, and that's when. You know, they physically don't have the cash available to distribute to schools based on um, the funding factor that they've set for school year budgets. For the raise? The State Department's just like a school district. They get a lump sum of money um, that's allocated and then they distribute it out to the districts. So they experience the same thing we do. So where are we at if, if we say we're giving our teachers this raise and then we have another tough economic times? Where? Is it another unfunded, unfunded mandate, or, or what is it? It would, it would be up to the, the districts to fulfill um, the certain legislative law. Um, so we Maybe have to make some cuts to, in order to fill the ability to, to give that raise. Makes perfect sense. Dr. Dunlop, I, want, I wanted to ask, uh, you know, we have a very, very committed community, a very involved community, and we are, as a school district, reaching out and attempting in many forms to communicate with our public. Could you kind of outline some of the things that we are doing as a district to inform our pub public as we move through this, uh, this trying time? Oh, sure. <laughs> uh, it's been a busy week. So we've, of course, been communicating through our normal uh, venues, through um, our, our school messenger, through social media, through email, through our website. Um, and then we've also um, been communicating through our local chamber and city. They, we had a rally here in, on, in downtown last, uh, last evening. Um, so those are some of the ways that we're trying to stay in communication with our community. Now as far as the teachers and our, and our staff, we have already sent out two surveys and we're basing all of our decisions on the results of those surveys. This is not the board or the superintendent leading this, it's the teachers leading this. And so we base our decision on whether to hold school or not on their responses of whether they, they are planning to continue the uh, demonstration at the Capitol or not. Um, I did get report today that the, the crowds at the Capitol are the biggest yet. So it's, it's not slowing down. You know, with the, uh, the uh, capital gains tax, have they put a number on how many individuals in Oklahoma that affects? Because I know with, with the, with the uh, obviously if you pay capital gains, you, you might be making some pretty good money, I would, yeah. I would assume. One of the sticking points with the capital gains that I've heard is that it, it hurts farmers and ranchers. So if, okay. you, if you sell cattle, then you have to pay capital gains on any of those you sell. Okay. Um, so they have talked about the possibility of taking or placing an exemption on, on cattle for farmers and ranchers on that. Um, and that may have a possibility, but it's, it's still gonna be a really an, a heavy lift to be able to get capital gains. Yeah. Um, to pass. But so far they've passed the fuel tax, which yes. is on general public. Mm -hmm. uh, they've passed the tobacco tax, mm -hmm. potentially the hotel tax. Potentially. And then the only other corporate tax was the production tax, correct? Uh, the GPT, yes. Yeah. Why did they, do you know why they backed out the turbine tax? I do not know. Because I remember sitting in regional meetings either last year or year before and a superintendent was talking to the 
the fact that uh, the wind energy is actually overtaking oil and gas for taking subsidies from the from the state. Well, that's the one that that uh, Senator Dom brought forth today. Okay. That the Senate Bill Six Double X was was to end that practice of giving them so many subsidies when they are clearly making profit. And we're, we're giving them subsidies in excess of their profits, so they're actually making money off of taxpayers. Because I'd heard that or I'd read that we don't tax them in Oklahoma, but as they transfer that electricity through other states, other states tax them. Tax but it when it comes where it in. generates from, we don't tax them at all, let them do it That's for correct. free and move through our state. That's correct. Okay. Again, makes perfect sense. <laughs> <laughs> Any further questions? Sounds like there's a lot of work to be done. Yeah, there is. There is. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Next item, Ms. Summers. You better not be Debbie Downer either. <laughs> well, uh, I actually bring to you this evening a little bit of ambiguity. Okay. Good right. deal. <laughs> I'm just going to add to the fun. Good. Do you have a clicker? No. Okay. Okay, so um, good evening, Dr. Dunlop, President Allen, members of the board. Um, I bring to you this evening just an update on our strategic plan, uh, how all the departments are, are proceeding. Uh, tonight is about 6.1 and 6.2 of our strategic plan, was, which was to create a roadmap to accomplish the configuration decision. So this is all about the high school. So really quickly, just to back up a bit, um, our timeline, take you back to about a year ago, uh, March of 2017, the steering committee that had been uh, put in place uh, to determine what, what the high school would look like, uh, they made a preliminary recommendation preliminary being the operative word. Uh, there was quite a bit of public feedback from that, so that kind of um, got us kind of marching on the ground as far as uh, what to do with that information. So April 2017, we did get a lot of community feedback through surveys. We had the two community forums on April 4th and 5th, dates I shall not forget. Uh, the steering committee decided at that point that they needed to pin their final recommendation until they had more information. Um, you all would probably agree that it, uh, it generated more questions than answers. So then district leadership determined that a visioning uh, task force needed to be put in place to ensure that form uh, followed function. So then May of June of last year, uh, they selected, or excuse me, 100 applicants uh, were um, putting in for the visioning task force. Uh, 30 member task force was selected. So that included teachers, parents, community leaders. All of these individuals, however, did have some sort of experience in curriculum and program development. That was one qualification that was very important to district leadership. Uh, and then in June, uh, the board approved a contract with facilitator Dr. Logosi, who is actually in the back of the room. Uh, Ms., uh, Dr. Gosi has been working very hard for the district. It is a lot of uh, moving pieces to get a 30 member committee going and kind of delegating and, and things like that. Um, so it's been a very productive uh, few months for sure. So that task force, uh, they convened in July of last year. They do have monthly meetings. Um, as I said, Dr. Gosey has parceled out uh, different programming areas around the nation that our task force is really looking into. And I mean, they are diving into the data. Uh, International Baccalaureate is one of those areas. STEM or STEAM as another early college high school and then academies or career pathways. Those are the four areas that are being explored very heavily. Uh, at the end, um, you know, we're kind of really wrapping up with the visioning task force. Next month, uh, they will, they need to get to a consensus, but then they will bring information and not necessarily a recommendation, but a roadmap, if you will, to the original configuration uh, steering committee. And, and then those two will, will come together to, to basically bring a recommendation to the board. Uh, we say summer of 2018. So we have up until what, September 21st to make that happen, right? Um, 
Okay, so uh, just to give you a little bit of background to that visioning task force, in addition to doing a lot of research in those uh, primary areas, Tulsa Tech has given presentations, Northeastern State, Tulsa Community College, and then a small group did go down to Plano, Texas ISD. They've got an academy down there that is heavily focused um, on interdisciplinary curriculum. So that, that really truly includes it all. It's not just you know science paired with English, it is bringing in French. It's bringing in art. It's really uh, quite remarkable. So they were debriefed on, on that uh, format as well. Uh, they have extensively, like I said, they've uh, researched those following program models, those four major ones. And just to give you a little bit of an update on where they stand with each of those, IB, they are not pursuing at this time, uh, really due to the high cost and the limited number of students that it impacts. Uh, IB is, is a phenomenal program. They appreciated the rigor, but there's no reciprocity between the IB program and kiddos who are involved in that program and our, our other, you you know, oh gosh, 3,400 other students who attend the high school. So uh, for now, that's not something that they're, that they're following through with at this point. Uh, STEM, STEAM, they are very interested in this area of programming. Uh, anytime you do um, a program study or an economic development study, kind of looking at what are the jobs, uh, what are folks, where's that, where's that skill gap? Uh, STEM STEAM always comes up, uh, lots of technology, of course, uh, manufacturing and things like that in this region. So they're very interested in pursuing that more. Uh, and conclusively, they did say that they want to incorporate the arts into the STEM models. Uh, early College High School, very interested in this area of programming. We have phenomenal partners already in the district, and Dr. Dunlop, um, Dr. Coates, they've laid a lot of groundwork already in those partnerships with NSU, with TCC, and so this really felt like a natural fit uh, that will be further developed and explored. And then the academies and career pathways, uh, the task force really likes that too because those really mesh well with the Early College High School model so um, all right so uh, the community focus groups provided some input so not only has our visioning task force that selected 30 member team have not only have they been researching but then dr. Gosey has had quite a few focus groups uh, in the community as well really just to get some feedback because we don't want to get to the end and have that recommendation be made public in the, and then the public feel like now, wait a minute, where did this come from? So that's, that's really the intention behind those focus groups. Uh, those met in December and in January, and the purpose was really to seek input beyond our task force. So what sort of external validation do we need from the community? What sorts of questions and concerns do they have? Um, and it really allows the district to provide some insight, uh, some rationale, and uh, also to, to really be transparent in this process. Uh, we had 92 people attend those, uh, representatives from the Chamber of Commerce, the City of Broken Arrow, all sorts of parent groups from all five middle schools and BAFA and the high schools. So a really great cross-section of, of folks attending those. Um, a summary of uh, the demographics of those folks as well as their feedback was provided to the visioning task force so they've read over those recommendations and questions as well and they will use that uh, as they move forward in their research so one thing that's interesting is that overall those public responses that were garnered from the focus groups were very much in line with what the visioning task force is researching and pursuing as well Five essential questions were given to those focus groups. So what expectations should our community have regarding the skills and abilities that our graduates, our graduates need to have and to demonstrate? So basically, what does a Broken Arrow High School graduate need to look like in their opinion? Uh, how can our district and schools continue to prepare those kiddos to basically narrow and then choose their career or academic path? Um, knowing what they know about their own education in today's world and projections of future industry, are there any changes in our current model that they think we need to consider? And then how can the community be more instrumental in partnering with students and with teachers? And then which of the initiatives that were under review, remember those four that I talked about, which of those should the district actually pursue uh, and or enhance? 
So our next steps, uh, the task force is going to continue to aggregate all of that data. Um, they'll take all the information from the focus groups, they'll take all of the information that they have learned through their research, uh, and um, they're basically going to need to reach a consensus. Um, so that's going to be, um, it, it's always a challenge to get 30 people on the exact same page, but um, I, I feel confident that you would have every uh, confidence in this task force. They work very hard, they take their role very seriously, and they've had some really great discussions. Uh, let's see, the steering committee will then use uh, the visioning task force's roadmap as a guiding factor uh, when they make their recommendation to you all in the summer of 2018. And then you guys will determine the next steps as far as, uh, you know, what happens next, which is always exciting. One question that we get a lot is, uh, okay, so once we decide, you know, once the board votes on, on a direction, how long? before a door opens, okay? So I do have, I've, I've already kind of given Ms. Bergwall a heads up as far as any timeline and building questions, she would be best served to, to uh, answer those. But generally speaking, once there is a, a plan and a direction, uh, there's about 12 months for programming and design and then another 18 months uh, for construction. All right, so uh, one of the critiques that we received last spring when the preliminary recommendation was made was that the public felt a little bit left in the dark or unaware of, of the rationale of how that decision was reached. Um, we've been giving fairly regular updates that have been provided um, after our visioning task force meets. Um, those are at baschools.org slash go BA. Once this is all finished, a complete summary of all of those meetings, of all of that focus group information, that will be made available to you all, and then we'll package it with our district branding and we'll get that out to the public as well. Any questions, I'm happy to answer, or Ms. Bergwall can help me out. I, I do want to uh, make a comment regarding the process itself. Um, I, I'm very appreciative of our community and the fact that they're very engaged. And as a result of their engagement and their interest, it caused us as a board to take a step back and look more broadly at what we were doing. And not to say that our intentions were not really good, they were, but again, I think it's important that we are listening to our community and we're making the adjustments we need to. I do believe this process as we moved into the uh, moved into getting the individuals within the classrooms, those for the visioning uh, process to take place before, you know, we were talking form and function, uh, to ensure that our programming was consistent. Certainly our parents need to know that, that our programming is equitable from one school site to the, to the other. But I, I definitely say that we are far better off today because of the many questions that were asked at the forum. And uh, even though sometimes that puts us back on our heels a little bit, I think it does cause us the appropriate reflection and it will cause us to have a better recommendation in the end and I think greater support from our community. So I want to thank everybody that's been involved with that. I think it's uh, definitely going to be a good process. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, it was, it was enlightening. No one would disagree. I, I think you're exactly right last spring. So. Well, it's refreshing to see too the uh, innovative aspect of it uh, versus the same old, same old of how districts have done that, and I appreciate that. That was one of the goals I had when we started this, that we could be innovative. Um, we are doing a cost analysis with what we in interpret the cost to be, which each one of those that we come up with from a district standpoint. I know the last time we, we, we maybe forgot about a school or what the cost was gonna be, is like, oops, we forgot that we're open <laughs> up, that's $2 million, whatever it was. So right. Are we doing that with that? So we, to help us maybe future build a bond or, or whatever we need. Yeah, definitely. Um, so in the IB program is an example of that, just the, the cost to implement that and then only serve a small, a very small component. What's interesting is that um, the, the other three models, and um, Dr. Gosey, if you want, you know, chime in or agree, disagree, or Dr. Dunlop, you've been at all of those, but um, STEM and STEAM, and then the, the academies or the career pathways and then the early college high school, uh, they're very intermingled. Um, okay. And so 
with the right sort of um, programming and approach to it, you could honestly end up with all three of those and, and not in, increase um, building capital by much. So Use the they, current dollars you have and not have any excess right. cost. That's good. I mean, that's a possibility. I'm not saying that's right. It's, it's well, we're going to hold you to it. Let's say it's feasible to do within the, the confines of right. the bond issue okay. that we're currently in. That's good. So. Yeah, they got all that info, I think, the first night. Like, here is where we are with the money, folks. <laughs> so, Ms. Summers, I would yes. also like to thank you for this very comprehensive report. Mm -hmm. uh, it certainly helps us know exactly where we are at this point. No problem. Thank you. Uh -huh. All thank right, you. and we'll be back in June then, I think, with the finance update for you guys on strategic plan. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Next item, number 13, Ms. James. I don't know if I've ever heard you present before. No, I have not. Right. I've only been with you guys for two months. Got so a rookie. I'm excited <laughs> to be doing this. Thank you, I know. Uh, well, good evening, President Allen, Dr. Dunlop, and members of the board. I'm here this evening to present our dropout report and our college remediation report for your review. Um, I'll walk you through it, and if you have any questions, I know you guys have had time to look at it. But um, On the very first sheet I've shared with you is our dropout data, and what that is looking at is 7th through 12th grade, kind of giving you an idea of the total number of students who start with us, 7th grade on up, and then who um, end up not graduating. The neat piece about this is it gives us a vertical picture of where we need to strengthen stuff, where we need to intervene. Um, and as it reflects, most of our students are dropping out when they get into high school, when the challenges of life, where they begin to see that um, they're credit deficient, or they just want to go straight to work. So that kind of shows you the number at that level. At the bottom is the graduation rate by the cohort. So this is any student, once they start ninth grade, they're in that cohort. So they have four years to graduate. If they do not, then that is counted as, you know, negatively on us. I will be clear on that also, that any student who joins us, who enrolls in our district, is considered in that cohort. So we could possibly have a student who joins us in their senior year as a or as a, in February who counts on our cohort. So the difficulty there is they come to us credit deficient. We don't have enough time to kind of close that gap and get them graduated. So that reflects in this also. Um, moving forward though, the good news is the State Department has come back and is like, well, let's look at this formula. So if you do graduate a student, um, a fifth year, they get a fifth year senior, we do get points for that moving forward in the formula. The last point I would like to point out is um, the 2017 cohort is a little lower. That's kind of a rough draft right now. That has been our ability to call and try to seek out these students who might have been with us as freshmen. Uh, their number is no longer there or they've blocked us. <laughs> they don't want to hear from us. Um, so the State Department does has refined their process to be able to locate those students for us a little bit better. They're able to find out three or four years later where they might have enrolled or what they might have been able to do in those four years. Um, I know Dr. Dunlop just got confirmation this past week for our 2016 cohort. So it does take a year or two for us to get that finalized. So I know that number, 85%, is not where we want to be, but I look for that to definitely increase by the time we get the final report. The next sheet is provided to us by the Oklahoma State Regents. Uh, what this is is telling us the number of students who enter college as freshmen, the number of those students who need to be remediated. So the Oklahoma State Regents and other college and universities decide what they will allow students to earn on their SAT or their ACT or other accepted university or college testing and if they will let them go into a class. So for instance, a student might have to have a 19 on their reading subscore on their SAT or ACT, excuse me, in order to go into comp one. If they don't have that, they will take a remedial course. So the state regents, this is our 2016 students who started college um, and it shows you, it's kind of highlighted across for you how we fall within Tulsa County. It's not in there in numerical order. So you can kind of look through that and see, which I feel like we're doing pretty well, but a better picture of that is that last page. On the last page, what I've put together for you is pretty much from 2011 on to 2016 to show that we are uh, lowering the number of our students who do require remediation. And I think you can see that through just the rigor and our curriculum alignment and the things that we have put in place up until now that shows that that is paying off, that less of the students are needing to go into those remediation courses. 
That last column, which is very confusing, says unduplicated. That percent are the students who are not having to take more than one remedial course. They're not duplicated in two different columns. Are there so any questions? Uh huh. Correctly, mm -hmm. in English since 2011, we have decreased our remediation mm -hmm. rate from 17.4 to 11. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, I know. Okay. It's exciting to see that. So from 17% to uh -huh. 11%. Yeah. Yeah, we dropped down to in the science area, the number of kids that it basically is a reading score that they're measuring for them to go into a science class um, or sometimes a math score. So that even shows you that our students are scoring high enough to go ahead and go into a college level course, which saves them money because remedial courses cost students money. That's not paid through. They cannot get that through a Pell Grant. It can't be paid. That's out of their pocket. And most of the time they're getting one credit hour for that, if that. So it is helpful for our students to make sure that when they are going to college that they are definitely where they need to be so that they can go directly into a course that's being paid with their Pell Grant or that does receive a three-hour credit. And we dropped 6% in math. I know, that's which right. is those two big areas right there are exciting to see. Mm -hmm. Did you have any other questions or anything on the dropout or anything I can clarify? It's good information. Good. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next item will be the consent items 14 through 80. I'm going to get to flipping here. Through 80. Move approval of the general consent agenda items 14 through 80. Second. Got a motion and a second. Please call the roll. Mr. Cockrell? Yes. Ms. Kelly? Yes. Mr. Majors? Yes. Mr. Denton? Yes. Mr. Allen? Yes. Next item 81, Ms. Kearns. Good evening. On a slightly less exciting note, I bring to you changes <laughs> in board policy. Our policy councils have met for the last time this year, so this is the last quarterly uh, report that we will bring to you unless legislation dictates that we need to change policy to be in compliance. This is a first read only. We'll be available, obviously, if you have any questions tonight uh, during the next month for questions for any policy members, and we'll bring this back to you in May for final action. Questions or discussion? Yes, I did have one question. Uh, on the final read, as you bring it back to the next meeting, will you make certain to have legal counsel review the changes? We, or? we certainly can. Okay. Is there any other questions? Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, next item, 82, Ms. Goodacre. <clears throat> Good evening, President Allen, Dr. Dunlop, members of the board. I'm here tonight to present our commodity processing for 2018-19. We get started on this really early. Um, we um, did a bid again this year with an area group, Jinx, Union, several of the area schools. Um, our um, bidding process has been approved by the state and um, we're bringing to you tonight um, the total for processing our commodities for 2018-19 is 453,543 and 57 cents and that's going to go to several things several different companies for beef pork chicken cheese and eggs do you have any questions I got to see your spreadsheet and subcommittee is quite the impressive. It's, there's a lot of them. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of stuff, a lot of food. <laughs> a lot of eggs. Any move, questions? Move approval. Second. Got a motion and a second. Please call the roll. Mr. Cockrell? Yes. Ms. Kelly? Yes. Mr. Majors? Yes. Mr. Denton? Yes. Mr. Allen? Yes. Ms. Goodegger, thank you for the uh, bid results as well. Thank wow. you. Next item. Hi. Good evening. Ms. Bergwald. <laughs> That's Mr. not Bob. No, no, no. Bob is uh, spending some time at home with oh, his new little one. Good. So, uh, good evening, President Allen, Dr. Dunlop. I bring for you tonight the approval for the student furniture for the balance of the Freshman Academy. 
project, as you know, we opened the addition this spring break, and then we'll continue renovation within the rest of the facility and a plan to replace all of the furniture uh, there at the Freshman Academy. So we ask for your approval tonight on the student furniture, and the next one will be the teacher furniture. Ms. Birdwell, I did want to make a comment related to the furniture and the ongoing long-term plan we has a, have as a school district to modernize our schools and ensure that the furniture uh, is new. I know over social media the last uh, week or so, some of our schools uh, in different parts of the state have been showing some of their school furniture, which has been extremely old and has not been updated. Certainly, I don't want to cast any aspersions on anyone in those districts, but what I want to say is that the good news is Broken Arrow Public Schools over the last many years have been working very hard to make certain that we are bringing our schools up to ensure that we have equity. And uh, even though we may have some that still do not have the brand new furniture, we are working to ensure that as we bring those schools up uh, to do that. And so I just want to say to you, I appreciate that very much. And I know the parents, obviously I'm not a parent, but I would think that would be very, they would be very appreciative of that as well. So thank you for that. I appreciate that comment. Any other comments or questions? I'll make a motion to approve. Second. Motion and a second. Please call the roll. Mr. Cockrell? Yes. Ms. Kelly? Yes. Mr. Majors? Yes. Mr. Denton? Yes. Mr. Allen? Yes. Next right. item, 84. Our next item involves the teacher furniture for that same building uh, from the previous um, agenda items, so the Freshman Academy. And this will buy new teacher desks and chairs, uh, bookcases, filing cabinets for all of the classrooms. Move approval. Second. Motion and a second. Please call the roll. Mr. Cockrell? Yes. Ms. Kelly? Yes. Mr. Majors? Yes. Mr. Denton? Yes. Mr. Allen? Yes. Next item, Ms. Bergewald. The next item I bring to you is to surplus the land formerly known as ESC North, the 601 South Main Street that is really the gravel lot to our north and that um, pie-shaped uh, area there. Um, asked to surplus that tonight so that we can work on looking at selling that property and freeing up some cash for additional uh, land purchases for the use of the district. Discussion? Make a motion to approve. Second. Got a motion and a second. Please call the roll. Mr. Cockrell? Yes. Ms. Kelly? Yes. Mr. Majors? Yes. Mr. Denton? Yes. Mr. Allen? Yes. Thank, Thank you. you. Next item, Ms. Coates. Good evening again, and I'll try not to make any motions myself on this one. Um, I bring to you uh, item number 86, and this is for the purchase of 1,540 for Chromebooks. This is for our freshman cohort of the class of 1819 beginning next year. And we have decided to go with a new company, uh, Trinity 3. And I'm going to bring up Mr. Chitty uh, to talk to you about this new company and our uh, decision making process and why we decided to go with this new company. Thank you. President Allen, Dr. Dunlop, and members of the board, thank you for welcoming me up here to discuss with you some of the research that, uh, that we've all been doing uh, to try to leverage the best uh, that we can, the money that we have, to support uh, the technology for our students, uh, those one-to-one -one instances for those students. As you guys know, we were able to grow to uh, Sequoia this year, and it's just been amazing, and we're continuing to grow that procedure um, into those middle schools as we go. And this purchase here is for our new incoming freshmen. And so uh, what we wanted to look at was, you know, what happened in the market of Chromebooks uh, was that uh, they gave them to you for a really good amount of money, got you addicted to them, right? And then they raised the prices up. And so our current, uh, uh, you know, vendor and resource that we were buying them from before was Asus, and uh, they actually had a $37 increase per device, which is very impactful when you're buying a large amount of them. And so we had to kind of go out and see what else was out there. Obviously, we don't want to uh, have a device that's not as good as that device. We want to stay with uh, our expectations of, of the device that we choose for our students. And so we went out and we tested a lot of different models. And then not only when we look at the device, we have to also look at who's selling it to us and, and 
get some resources out um, and have them do some things for you. Because for every Chromebook that we have, there's actually physical work that has to be done to the Chromebook to get it ready in our systems and all that. And I know uh, Mr. Stout and the technology department has really worked with us over the summertime and have put people to work for weeks to get those all ready. And so one of the things we really wanted to do was see if we can resource vendors to kind of help us out with some of that work. And so uh, Trinity 3 uh, is a company that's been around, uh, I think, since 2009. Um, uh, they are a v very big market for uh, reselling uh, devices and not only are they just a, a reseller uh, they do the work on the devices. So they actually have a, uh, a writing policy into our Google management to where they can get every one of these devices, all 1,544 of them, ready. They supply us with data that goes in our internal database, that goes into our, uh, our Wi-Fi connectors that allows them to connect immediately with very minimal work on our side to get those things ready. And so they offered this. Uh, obviously nothing's free, but the cost was very little actually uh, to get this done. They're also offering um, uh, better warranties, uh, parts closets, so um, our, our uh, Chrome desk areas, which are, are, are just been amazing, uh, they're actually going to have like a, a resource uh, sitting there. We're not going to have to order upon you know, a need. There, there's going to be a surplus of an amount and then when we'll actually scan uh, the, the item that we're using and then it goes to a spreadsheet to them and they always make sure we have a certain amount. And so it's a really kind of neat process uh, that we're looking at for those. Um, so that's the process we're going to use from kind of here on out, seeing how successful it is for our one-to-one -one purchases. Um, any purchases, as you guys know, we've, I think, just in since January, uh, we've purchased, our district has purchased like 1,500 devices at our middle schools with site money and title money and things like that. Those purchases are still at the lesser amount with just the one-year warranty, um, and we're still servicing those different. But the parts closets and all that will just house our students' one-to-one uh, -one facilities and those. So we have all this stuff uh, planned in the back end, but this company has been uh, working with us. We've bought from them since November, and so we've worked through all of the connections and everything that we need from them, what they need from us, and we have ha had a lot of success with them. We've met with them in person um, and feel very confident that they're going to give us what we need, and we're, I feel like, I mean, Dr. Coates would agree that we're getting the better end of the deal here. Um, they're doing a lot for us for very little. Okay. Questions? All right. Make a motion to approve. Second. Motion and a second. Please call the roll. Yes. Mr. Ms. Kelly? Yes. Mr. Majors? Yes. Mr. Denton? Yes. Mr. Allen? Yes. Thank you. Appreciate nice you job. guys. Have a great evening. Nice job, Mr. Chief. Next item will be Ms. Coates. She'll be joined by, with, by, sorry, Dr. Goodson. Yes. Come I'm uh, very excited if you guys want to come on up. Um, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Lee Goodson and Melissa Studley. Uh, Dr. Goodson is the president of TCC, and they're here tonight to talk about our new and exciting program that we are bringing to Broken Arrow. It is the start of our early college high school. It is called 2 plus 2 or dual credit to college degree. It is partnership with TCC and NSU. We are going to provide um, 60 uh, credit hours or college credit hours towards an associate's degree with TCC. They take classes at NSU, so they are triply enrolled. Basically, they are going to get their high school credits they're going to um, be enrolled at TCC to get their associate's degree, and then they're taking the classes at NSU. And the goal is to create um, basically a pipeline to NSU so that they can continue on and earn their bachelor's degree. So I'm going to go ahead and let Dr. Goodson talk to you about this arrangement. Yes, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Coates. And uh, thank you, President Allen and Superintendent Dunlop and members of the board. We're so excited to be here. Lissa Steadley is uh, the face and muscle both behind <laughs> all of our dual enrollment and uh, early college high programs at Tulsa Community College. We're the largest provider of dual and um, concurrent enrollment in the state, providing about 20% actually of the credits that are awarded before a student graduates from high school. So we're really excited about this new partnership uh, and our good friends, Dr. Steve Turner and everybody at NSU Broken Arrow are excited about it as well. Uh, we're excited to offer a liberal arts degree right there at NSUBA to your juniors and seniors beginning the summer before their junior, junior year. They will start, they'll take 
six hours, right, Lisa? I've got this right. Five hours that summer, and then they will take nearly full-time loads each semester after that as they walk across the stage for um, their diploma, their high school diploma. They'll also be earning an associate's degree. These students will move in a cohort. You may not know that we're already offering 15 sections of concurrent enrollment for Broken Arrow High School students. 12 of those sections, I think I've got my numbers close at least, uh, are right there at the NSUBA campus and then there's a few other sections at your high school campus. So, um, but these students will move as a cohort and that's something different. And so we've done a lot of uh, work together, I wanna say, um, thanks specifically to Lissa and our team at TCC, Dr. Coates, your team, and um, uh, Dr. Dunlop, especially for the partnership. And then uh, I can't, Dr. Turner's not here, Dr. Steve Turner's not here. He, I left him at the HLC convention in Chicago. Uh, I had dinner with him the other night. He's still there, he comes back tomorrow. But I can't say enough about the partnership with Broken Arrow. And um, as this moves along, it really has the potential to be very high impact for your entire community, giving students the opportunity to complete that associate's degree while in high school and then move straight in to their bachelor's program. So I think I hit the high points. Lissa, do you, is there anything else you wanna add? Just um. I think we'd just like to say um, how much uh, Tulsa Community College enjoys working with your staff at the high school um, and your students. Um, this is just really a natural next step for us to move this. Most of your students graduate now with between 18 and 24 credit hours from the program that we're running now. And this is just the next iteration, the next step. So we thank you. Dr. Goodson and Ms. Dudley, I, I wanted to just speak up and say how much we appreciate the work that you have done with us. This has been, uh, what, about two much. years in the making. Um, and, and I've worked with, I think, Lissa since 2007 or 2008. It's been a long time. Um, but this has been a long time in the, in the making. As, and as Dr. Goodson said, this, this is a deal changer for our entire community. Um, something we didn't mention is the cost. So if I'm a parent out here, I'm going, hmm, do I have an eighth grader or anybody who could do this? So the, the cost fee structure that we have in place, if you have a, a student and you qualify for Oklahoma's Promise, you will be able to earn an associate's degree free of charge. Yes, free of charge, zero dollars. If you do not qualify for Oklahoma's Promise, there is a small amount of fees. Is it twelve hundred? It's, it's just a little over twelve hundred dollars for the entire mm -hmm. program. That's all sixty hours. So to show me where mm -hmm. you can get a college degree for twelve hundred dollars. Um, the partnership with NSU is equally as important because we have uh, created a, a partnership where they're providing guidance counselors there on on campus. So they already have a college advisor. They'll transition so smoothly into a bachelor's degree program because of the plans of study that have been um, um, matriculated or art articulated, there we go, um, with uh, TCC. And um, so as we said, this is a deal changer for our community. We're gonna focus on in areas that we know will add economic development in our community. Uh, when, we, when our chamber is and our city is working to try to bring businesses into Broken Arrow, one of the biggest things they ask is about the education system and the ability to create an educated workforce. This is how we do it. And so I want to thank Dr. Coates, Dr. Goodson, Ms. Steadley. It, great work, and I'm very excited about this partnership. I'd also like to thank Ms. Burns and her team. Um, when we... Uh, moved or decided that we were going to move forward with this program she and her team identified um, 89 students that potentially could qualify so we're going to have a parent meeting we have a whole communications plan um, that we're going to begin this Friday and then the our parent information meeting is next Tuesday and so we're going to invite those 89 students to apply and we're hoping to get um, if we get half if we get 40 we'll be ecstatic that would be two sections if we get 60 um, that would be three sections that would start as a cohort with TCC at NSU so we're really excited about this so I bring to you 
this memorandum of understanding. Is, is there a cap in the number of students that are gonna be able to be in the program at any time? There is, we, we cannot, at this time, can't do more than 60. That's three Her sections cohort. that we, mm -hmm. okay. so, so next year we'd have another 60, 60 that would start and another 60. That's a, that's a good number of kids can mm -hmm. my 500 freshmen Mm -hmm. school. And one thing I failed to mention that's critical to this partnership and the, the reason why we were able to make this financially um, doable is because TCC has agreed to allow their instructors to use OERs or open stacks and so our students are used to the digital textbooks they're used to this format and so I think it's just a win-win for both of us so we're really looking forward to this program. Are, are they doing that anywhere in the state we have a community college partnered with a four-year school and I mean in this area no, not the same format yeah absolutely it's exciting there are many community colleges that partner with universities but not the same format as the well, as well. when you I, I don't know of any that are triply enrolled where you're enrolled in all mm -hmm. three entities at the same time and what I'll mention one last thing that we are going to look for in, in those 89 students Miss Burns and her team um, they put together an application packet and we would like to identify at least if we can find 10 students that are interested in the teacher education program um, so that we can grow our own teachers here in Broken Arrow mm -hmm. yes. There we go. Move approval. Second. Motion and a second. Please call the roll. Thank you. Mr. Cockrell? Yes. Ms. Kelly? Yes. Mr. Majors? Yes. Mr. Denton? Yes. Mr. Allen? Yes. Thank you very much. Thank it's you. exciting. Thank you. Next item, number 88, Ms. Enoff. Good evening, President Allen, Dr. Dunlop, members of the board. This is where we are at as of the end of March. Um, only a few months left in the fiscal year to get through. Our uh, state aid allocation, as a reminder, $44.3 million, um, $400,000 <coughs> uh, adjustment at our midterm um, from some of the cuts that we saw across common education um, this winter. Um, what we discussed earlier in the evening, the million dollar question right now is where will that funding factor be going into 1819 for all of the new legislation that has been passed and um, what will that actually look like for Broken Arrow? So we'll be keeping a close eye on that. Our ad valorem dollars have continued to come in strong. We'll um, probably receive one last payment for that in the month of April. Um, and we typically collect very high in that area, and so that's a very good stable source of revenue for us. Building fund, again, same situation with our ad valorem and um, collections and child nutrition continues to be our a self-sufficient fund um, in terms of how they collect revenue for uh, student lunches and uh, for our federal free and reduced kiddos. General fund expenditures, um, you can see some of the effects that we've had for some of the reductions that we've made um, over the past fiscal year. Salaries and benefits is 85% of our general fund budget, leaving us you know, roughly 15% to cover everything else that a district of 19,000 students over 2,000 employees needs to operate on a daily basis. That is a very slim uh, margin for what we're operating on on a day-to-day -day basis, but um, we are hopeful that with some of the infusion back into um, our general operating budget for school districts across um, the state of Oklahoma, that this will help um, address some of the other issues that we're having, not just with teacher pay raises, but also um, class sizes and making sure we have sufficient um, curriculum and programming and all the other things that go on behind the scenes to make a school district um, function appropriately. Building fund. Um, Again, this is a very small uh, revenue source, and so we have to leverage our expenditures appropriately, utilities and 
such and a few small um, few isolated salaries are paid from this fund and um, when you think of the number of square feet that we have to operate maintain clean um, and um, like maintain over the district they have a very small budget as well to make all those things happen our operations department does a very good job at making sure those dollars stretch efficiently and child nutrition is um, where we purchase all of their food supplies materials and um, everything else that takes that department to run and operate so the April 1st, April 2nd um, cutoff for regular spending across the district has come and gone. And we do that for a couple of reasons. We do that um, to try and um, get a better picture of where we will be at the end of year as far as cash for uh, projections going into next year. And to give the board um, uh, an estimate of where our ending fund balance will be at the end of June. Um, are there any questions? Ms. Enough, did you hear anything on the bill to allow to use building funds for other salaries or anything? Has that moved anywhere within the, down the Capitol? As far as other teacher salaries? Yeah, they, they were coming up with a bill to use, you could use building funds more broadly. I don't know if it got any, if you I haven't heard of any word okay. of traction on it. We do, um, like I said, pay for a few um, of our maintenance and custodial staff out of building fund. That is um, written in law that we can do that. But again, we have to leverage those funds with the revenue that comes in, and it's mainly from our ad valorem dollars. And um, Ms. Bergwall and her staff depend on those funds sure. to operate their uh, departments appropriately. So it seemed like that would be a slippery slope of uh, getting into that if you're using funds to should be going for maintenance or upkeep and things like that you pay one or the other something is going to be sacrificed right salaries are obviously a reoccurring ex mm -hmm. expense that we have to fund first and then everything else comes second okay. any other questions okay thank you next item my next item is to ask the board to approve our application uh, for temporary appropriations for the 1819 school year um, this is what gets our legal budget set before um, we do our end of year financial reporting this is sent to the um, county excise board for approval and i ask the board to approve that for all funds tonight move approval second motion and a second please call the roll mr cockrell yes Ms. Kelly? Yes. Mr. Majors? Yes. Mr. Denton? Yes. Mr. Allen? Yes. Next item, Ms. Enoff. My last item is to ask the board to authorize um, the negotiation process with the uh, Broken Arrow Educators Association for the 1819 contract year. We did receive their letter of intent to negotiate with us, and um, this is just um, to begin the process. We've always had a very collaborative relationship with them and um, we look forward to another successful year of negotiations discussion make a motion to approve second oh, motion a second please call the roll mr cockrell yes miss kelly yes mr majors yes mr denton yes mr allen yes thank you Thank you, Ms. Enoff. Next item, 91, new business, we have none. Uh, next item, 92, would be to move to executive session. Make a motion to move to executive session. Second. Motion and a second, please call the roll. Mr. Cockrell? Yes. Ms. Kelly? Yes. Mr. Majors? Yes. Mr. Denton? Yes. Mr. Allen? Yes. Uh, move we return from executive session second got a motion and a second that we return from executive session please call the roll mr cockrell yes miss kelly yes mr majors yes mr denton yes mr allen yes okay next item will be the statement of the executive session minutes by the board clerk <clears throat> one second all right 
Uh, the Board of Education and Dr. Janet Dunlop and Michelle Bergwall entered into executive session at 7.19 p.m. to discuss the purchase or appraisal of certain real property in accordance with Oklahoma Statute Title 25 OS Section 307B3 and to discuss the employment contract of the Superintendent of Schools as authorized by Oklahoma Statute Title 25 Section 307B1 and 7 of the Oklahoma Open Meeting Act. At 8.45 p.m., Michelle Bergwald departed, and at 8.51, Dr. Janet Dunlop exited uh, the executive session. Uh, the Board of Education returned to open session at 8.23 p.m. This constitutes the minutes of the executive session. Thank you. Holy smokes. Item 95, discussion? Uh, I move the uh, new three-year contract for Dr. Janet Dunlop. Second. Got a motion and a second. Please call the roll. Mr. Cockrell? Yes. Ms. Kelly? Yes. Mr. Majors? Yes. Mr. Denton? Yes. Mr. Allen? Yes. Next item would be to adjourn. Make Good. a motion to adjourn. Second. Motion and second. Please call the roll. Mr. Cockrell? Yes. Mr. Majors? Yes. Ms. Kelly? Yes. Mr. Denton? Yes. Mr. Allen. Yes. Give me a curveball there. You went out of order. I'm sorry. <laughs> 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 I wouldn't quite read it.